One line of code spurred a series of momentous events in blockchain history. The line of code in red, it was moved up to where the green line is, and that was done to neutralize a re-entrancy exploit in the following line, rewardaccount.payout, which when performed on an attacker's account would, uh, would um, lead to what happened to, to the DAO. The description for this talk was before these momentous events, and there's too much security advice to share and not enough time that the BTC relay portion of this talk is omitted. Here's a bonus tip. Label your untrusted contracts. So in the reward account dot payout account line, already you can see that there are two accounts here, and it's not as clear maybe immediately which account is untrusted. So a better way to even rewrite this maybe is to reward account dot payout untrusted account. And then when people see that, it can uh, help, help you be more aware of what might happen. And as an additional tip, message sender can also be untrusted. So if it's always untrusted, then you, you, you definitely need to put a comment in your code that just to make people more aware. Namil Dalal, Simon Della Rouvier, and I started the community resource for smart contract security tips. We are grateful to seven others so far who have are listed as contributors in GitHub. The emphasis is on community because security is not just for a handful of developers to write about and the content needs to be aggregated and easy for people to find instead of being fragmented and scattered. We start with some points about general philosophy before extending much further and getting more technical. The first point is to prepare for failure. The, the fir this is not about defeat or giving up. This is to try to be ready for the unknown unknowns. This can be very difficult to do, but it is possible in some cases. And the next slide is an example of this. The second example, the second point, is to roll out carefully. Production, a production system needs baking time in production. The strongest swords are forged by repeatedly processing them in a pro process of putting them in fire and hammering them. It takes time. So for contracts, they should be put through test nets and then a beta on mainnet before a production launch on mainnet. Keeping contracts simple is an obvious tip, but the process of simplification can lead to surprising results, even in a system that already looks simple. To stay up to date, there's a bibliography at the repo for the community resource that everyone is welcome to contribute to. Be aware of blockchain properties is what the rest of this talk relates to. As promised, here's an example of preparing for failure. The contract keeps track of its expected fund balance. Check invariance throws if the actual balance of the contract is smaller than the expected balance. And this check invariance is called at the end of some of the key functions in the contract. Now the emergency call sends the balance to the workshop account only if the invariant is broken. The invariant should not get broken, but just in case it does, the emergency call will send the funds away. Anyone can invoke the emergency call, and the plan is to have a server call it every second. If there is a breach that the contract's balance is smaller than what it expects, the hope is that most of the funds can be sent to the workshop instead of being drained to an attacker. 
contracts calling each other is powerful and can lead to emergent use cases. But care must be taken for external calls that a contract makes. The recommendation is to avoid calls to untrusted contracts as much as you can. Untrusted means any contract that you have not written. This is because if you call someone else's contract, they or one of their dependencies could accidentally call a malicious contract. In the chain of contract calls, all it takes is for one contract to make a mistake. Thus, assume that untrusted contracts are malicious. Avoid calling do something or address.call on an untrusted contract. The key point is that after any untrusted call, assume that the state of your contract has been manipulated. Here's a diagram to help. There's a few things here, but let's start at the foo function. It decrements x, and then it calls a, an untrusted contract. The fallback function of the untrusted contract executes, and it can call foo. This is an example of recursive reentrancy. It's important to realize that reentrancy can use any of the contract's public functions, meaning an attacker can reenter using the function g or bar. This is why after the untrusted call, the contract can't assume anything at all about the values of x or y. A second tip is to use send and avoid call.value. If you've seen examples of vulnerable code, especially regarding reentrancy, they all involve call.value. Because using send instead of call.value does not give the attacker enough gas to do damage with reentrancy. The attacker only gets 2,300 gas. With great power comes great responsibility, and that applies to call.value. And so the tip is to use send and avoid call.value. Perhaps the most mature best practice is to handle errors in raw calls. Raw calls such as address.send and address.call return false if they fail. This is unlike invoking a do something method, which propagates an exception if it encounters one. So the good example is to check, check the result, and the bad example is an unchecked send. A tip that goes together with using send is to keep fallback functions simple. The last fallback function is advised against because, one, it uses more than 2,300 gas. Second, it asks callers to break the tip of using send and asks them to use the riskier call.value. A call depth attack can be used by an attacker to make all of your contracts calls to fail. The, the, the Ethereum virtual machine has what the yellow paper calls a contract, a message call slash contract creation stack, and it has a maximum depth of 1,024. An attacker can make recursive calls to bring the depth to 1,023, call your function, which brings the depth to 1,024, and now all of your contract's calls will fail. In this example, simple example, an attacker can force a recipient to lose their refund. So the attacker recurses to bring the depth to 1,023, then calls withdraw refund using the address of a victim recipient, and the depth is now at 1,024. The, the refunds for the recipient will be set to zero. This pointer doesn't work 
well to show that. And when the victim calls withdraw a refund, the, the send will fail, and then when the victim calls, tries to withdraw their own refund, the refund will already be set to zero, so they can't get it back. As an improvement, the return value of send could be checked. However, a preferred solution is to write this contract so that message sender will pull their refund as opposed to the insecure contracts approach of pushing the refund to a recipient. This has had to be a quick presentation, and there's plenty more information and examples such as pullover, push, denial of service against contracts, and reentrancy that can be found in the repo and the wiki page. To recap, some of the main points for smart contract security are prepare for failure, roll out carefully, keep contracts simple, and calling untrusted contracts is always dangerous. The danger may seem small, but if an attacker finds and exploits a bug in a compiler that is targeting the EVM, they are likely to do much more damage if their untrusted code is executed than one where they only have a compiler bug to work with. Here are the links to a security resource of the community, by the community, for the community. I also have slides regarding denial of service and pullover push, or can take two questions in the remaining three minutes. Any questions? Okay, I'll, I can quickly go through a couple more. So, so quickly in this, um, a denial of service against the contract, there are many ways that, uh, pitfalls that you can encounter them. One is um, an unexpected throw, which is what this code example here is about, but hitting the block S limit is another example, iterating through an unbounded array is another example, misunderstanding gas refunds will also cause the same issue. So in this um, example contract, the, the line with the throw means that a current leader that refuses payment will permanently be the leader. And the throw cannot be removed in this case because otherwise some other person can do a call depth attack against bid. And what that means is that they will get to be the current leader without having had to pay the previous leader. So in this example, you can't just remove throw. And for the final uh, tip that we only have time for here is um, to change this into a pullover push uh, system. And so the left side is the auction contract that was shown just a couple of slides ago. This time, instead of doing a send to the recipient, it just, the contract just keeps track of the refunds that, that are owed to whoever the highest bidder is. And then on the right side is the pull method where everything works based off message sender. And by doing this, an attacker can basically only attack themselves. So that's it.